Hello. It is again. Uh, don't worry. You won't be seeing too much of me after Uncle Lenny, Pastor Lenny gets back. So thank God. Yeah, I was just telling Pastor Richard this morning that it's amazing how Pastor Lenny may come out of this whole thing better than he went in because because of all of this, he was able to repair the other eye that went bad before. That wasn't that wasn't fixed properly last time. So now, you know, by God's grace, he may regain the sight of both his eyes. So thank God. God is so good to us, you know, in ways that we don't expect. So um, today. We're going to go over the first half of Romans 8. Romans 8 is called the Great Eight by some pastors because it's considered what may be the greatest chapter in the Bible. Now, when I read, when I found out that it was called the Great Eight, I actually felt that pressure because for my the second message that I'm ever going to give, it's going to be about the greatest chapter in the Bible. So I felt a lot of pressure, but. Um, Anyway, I hope that uh, I can honor God and just properly deliver this message to everyone uh, in a responsible way, in an orthodox, biblical way. Um, So here we go. Um, So before we start, let's jump back to last week. Last week, we covered chapter... Chapter... I changed to a different mic. Sorry, my voice is not that loud, so I need a mic to speak. Thank you. Okay, so Pastor Richard covered this last week. This is the end of Romans 7. Now, let's read this together. Uh, out loud, okay? So I find it to be a law of sin, that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So what is the law of sin that Paul is talking about here? It's the law where we know what we want to do, what what is right to do, but something in us, the sin in us, makes us do what's wrong. For whatever, for some reason, that's the way the nature of our sin works. So it prevents us from doing any good, any good that God can be pleased with. And Paul says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? It's a desperate situation. It sounds dire, right? So last week, Sorry, I jumped a little earlier. Last week, Pastor Richard went over, had everyone read Romans 7.15. Romans 7.15 says, For I do not know, understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. So it says, For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. And he asked everyone to raise their hands. And um, when he asked everyone to raise their hands, I raised my hand, and I saw nobody else raise their hand. And then I looked to the side of me. I didn't want to look back because I didn't want to look stupid and see that nobody else raised their hand. So I only saw like one other person raise their hand. So I'm going to give you guys another chance to raise your hands today. Okay? But let's go over this a little more. So who wants to, who knows the right thing to do, but it doesn't do it anyway. We have a superficial struggle over doing the right thing, and we have a spiritual struggle over doing the right thing. So let's go over some superficial things that we struggle with. We struggle with losing weight. We want to lose weight, but we can't help getting up in the middle of the night to eat an ice cream bar, right? That's a, that's a superficial struggle. I don't consider that a spiritual struggle. We want to quit smoking, but we just can't help but take that extra puff. But how about some spiritual struggles? What's a spiritual struggle? You want to obey your parents, but you can't. You always do 
exactly the opposite of what your parents want us to do. That's a violation of one of the commandments, right? The fifth commandment. We want to spend more time studying the Bible, but we don't. Instead, we watch Netflix or YouTube. Violation of the first commandment, right? Love your God with all your heart. You promise God you're not going to swear again, right? You promise God you're not going to say any more bad words. But when you're with your friends, you curse like a sailor in front of them. <laughs> Violation of the third commandment. You want to lead a pure life, but when you sit in front of a computer, you go to those websites that you know defile your spirit. It's a violation of the 10th commandment, right? You're coveting, you're trying, you want something on that screen that you can't have. And on and on and on, and to the point where like, you're just like, oh my God, how do I get out of this? I just, nothing I can do where I can break this cycle of bondage. And when I was little, I always thought the struggle looked like this. You probably saw these kind of things. I use the more common, uh, more recent, Cartoon to illustrate this. Anyone think about the struggle between good and evil like this? You have a good angel, and then you have a demon on this, each side of your shoulder. And each one, there's this inner monologue that goes on in your head, right? Whenever you make a decision about something, there's always that angel and the demon talking back and forth. Some of you probably literally have these discussions in your head where there's two things talking back and forth. This is how I imagine it was like. So, I'm going to give you guys one more chance to raise your hands. Who, who knows the right thing to do, but doesn't do it anyway? Raise your hands. Okay, I would say that most of us it applies to, right? Okay, good. So now we're on the same page. I'm glad you guys redeemed yourself. I hope uh, Pastor Richard feels better after last week. But only two people raised their hands. All right, so... I've got some good news and I've got some bad news while we go over Romans 8. The good news is Romans 8 is going to show us how we can be free of the power of temptation. The bad news is we can't do it on our own. There's no way. We can't do it. But the good news is there's more good news. There's someone that can. There's someone that can help us break this, this cycle of bondage. But again, there's also bad news. It's not going to be an easy journey. It's going to be difficult, but in the end, it's all going to be good news. It's all going to be good news, regardless of the struggles that we face, because it will be worth it from the peace and the joy that we'll receive in our hearts. So let's start looking at um, Romans 8. Let's read this together. And we'll take it section by section. Let's read Romans 8, 1 to 2 first. There is therefore, we'll read it together, okay? There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So one thing important to see over here is that Paul uses the word for. Now what does for word indicate? And um, I tell you, if you guys are interested in digging deeper into this, there's a series that Pastor John Piper, he's a pretty well-known guy, he goes really, really deep into this. I actually watched five hours of his sermons to extract the most important parts so that I could share with you today. Now, he spent, on this one word for, he spent, I think, 30 minutes talking about it. And you're thinking, like, what's the big deal for this word for? Well, let me explain to you why this word for is so important. Because the word for indicates that we are free in Jesus Christ because of the law of the Spirit, because we are no longer condemned. What that means is that by our faith, when we are made righteous, immediately, Pastor Lenny and Pastor Richard said positionally, we are justified, we are made righteous in His eyes. So because of that, then, we, for the law of spirit of life, has set us free. So it's not, the problem with the misinterpretation of the scripture is that we think that we need to live, we need to live according to the law of the spirit of life in order to be set free. But the thing is, we're set free first by being righteous through our faith. And then we are allowed, we're given the chance to live according to the spirit of life. That's very important, and we'll go over that deeper 
as we go on. Let's read starting from, from verse 3. Together. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do, by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. So what is that saying? It says as law, the law no longer has any power. Because the law that was given to Moses no longer has any power, the Ten Commandments, it no longer has any power because our flesh is incapable of fulfilling those laws. There's no way, just like we talked about before. In and of itself, the law is good. Ten Commandments, we can all agree, is a good thing, right? And we can try our hardest in our own strength to fulfill it, but that'll never happen because that's not the way that it works. The, the flesh, and we'll, and we'll go over later, that the flesh will just not allow us to fulfill it. Let's read verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So only by walking in the Spirit will we have a chance to fulfill the law. And I say chance because walking in the Spirit is a choice that we can make. How much we want to be filled by the Holy Spirit is entirely dependent on how much we ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit and walk with Him according to the Spirit. Now, when we talk about the law, in, in Romans, it constantly, Paul constantly talks about something called the law. What is the law? In the Old Testament, there are 613 laws that God gave the Jews to follow. That's a pretty tough act to follow. It's a pretty difficult thing to live up to. But Paul says this in Galatians 5.14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That makes it a lot easier, right? Instead of 613 laws, it becomes distilled into one. One sentence, and that is, love your neighbor as yourself. That sounds pretty easy, right? But if we try to do that, haven't we all struggled with loving our own neighbor? We, we, we can hardly love our parents. We can hardly love our, our siblings. How hard is it to even love your neighbor? Now, in Luke 10, Jesus, the, a, uh, a lawyer came up to Jesus and asked him who his neighbor was because Jesus was preaching the gospel of love to everyone. So this guy thought he was so smart. He's, a, he's an expert in the Jewish law. So he went up to Jesus and said, well, so who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him the story of the Good Samaritan. For the people that don't, aren't familiar with that story, the story of the Good Samaritan is there was a guy who was uh, traveling somewhere and then a gang of thugs came up to him and beat him and robbed him and left him for dead. And while he was bleeding to death in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the road, a priest passed him by and he called out for help. And this priest, most likely it was a Jewish priest, just walked right by him. Later on, a Levite. A Levite are the, is, the, um, is the tribe that God assigned to become the priest for the Jews. So he called out to the help of the Levite, and the Levite just walked by. And then a Samaritan walked towards the man, and he called out for help. The Samaritans were the enemies of the Jews. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans because they practiced worship of God in a totally different way that they felt they didn't honor God. But the Samaritan, what does the Samaritan do? The enemy of the guy, because I don't think the Samaritan knew what kind of man this was. I don't know if he knew. But the Samaritan took that man, took him to a place to stay, paid for his stay, and for the food that he needed to eat so that he can recover. So, at the end of the story, Jesus asked the lawyer, the expert in the law, who is the neighbor? In this story, who's the neighbor? What do you think? Who the, who's the neighbor in this story? Is it the man who got beat up and left for dead? Or is it the Samaritan? And the lawyer, he said it was the Samaritan that was the neighbor. Now, what was interesting about that story, about that parable, is why Jesus turned the entire question around on him. 
The lawyer was asking who the neighbor was. He, in that story, you would assume the lawyer is the guy who got beat up, right? You were supposed to help the people who were in need. But Jesus turned it around and made him realize that we are all the neighbors. If we, we know how we want to be treated as the neighbor. So Jesus, instead of making him look outward, he made the guy look inward and see that you're the neighbor. You would want this, anyone to be, anyone to treat you the same as you would want to treat them. So this is one of the cool things that I like what Jesus does. He, he always subverts, he always turns the question around and makes you think about how you are. So instead of us categorizing, what this guy wanted to do was, he wanted to categorize who he could be nice to. He was asking Jesus, so are there some people, basically what he's asking is, are there some people who I don't have to be nice to? That's basically what he's asking, right? But Jesus turned it around and said, you have to be nice to everybody. Nobody is your enemy, all right? So when we talk about fulfilling the law in one sentence, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Jesus is talking about. It's about loving everybody. There's no limits. There's no constraints. There's no categorizing. So we're going to get a little bit technical right now. And I purposely created these diagrams because for me it helps to illustrate and visualize how what, what, what we call the battlefield looks like. So we think that God is really concerned about the wars that we fight on this earth. We think like, oh, the desert storm, the, uh, the wars that we had in the Middle East, the Vietnam War, World War II. We think God is really concerned about these kind of wars, right? And I'm sure God is concerned for the people that are fighting those wars. But what God is more concerned about, or in the internal perspective, is the battle for our souls. So what does the battlefield look like? It looks like this. This is the battlefield for our soul. Now, let's go over this. Now, I have to first disclaim that this is a highly abstracted diagram of what it is. This is a tripartite, basically three parts, um, a three-part description of man, of who we are. There are theologians that think, that believe that it's actually just two, that the soul and the spirit are one. But we're not going to go too much detail into that, because the Bible does break it down into three parts, and I wanted to make that clear. So on the left, we have God. And then on the right, we have Satan. In this case, when we talk about how God interacts with us, it's through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in Greek is called a paraclete. Paraclete means the advocate. He speaks for us. On this side, we have Satan. And uh, Satan represents the world. It represents our flesh, our carnal desires and our human nature. And then in the middle, you have us. Human beings are consisted of these parts however you want to group them up, okay? You have the spirit, which is our conscience, the way we commune with God. This is, our, this is the way we connect with God as human beings. And our intuition, the thing that tells us what's right and wrong to do. And then you have the soul. The soul is our intellect, our heart and our mind, basically the thoughts that we normally, that uh, we use to process. And then you have the body, which is of course our physical body. And these are the three parts the three general abstracted parts of man. Okay, I don't want to go, I don't want, again, I don't want to separate this too clearly because the lines are not that clearly defined. There's a quote that I like from Watchman Nee. It's, he says, God dwells in the spirit, self dwells in the soul, and the senses dwell in the body. The battle between good and evil is a tug of war for the control of man's soul. All right. Um, I'm going to do something that we don't normally do, but is this clear for everyone? I want to, and I'm opening, basically I'm opening up to questions. Is this clear? Does everyone understand that this is what the battleground looks like? Okay, let's move on. <laughs> I hope it's because I made it really clear. All right, so this diagram indicates the state of man after Adam. After Adam, our connection with God was severed. There was a spiritual death in all of mankind. So what was left? If there's no spirit connecting us, if there's no connection with God anymore, if we died spiritually, then what does that leave us? Then it leaves us our relationship to the world. We no longer have communion with God. And 
There's a verse down here that says, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who have not sinned in the likeness of, likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. So what that verse is saying is, all of us have Adam's sin nature, regardless of the sin that we committed. Even though it's not like the sin that Adam create, uh, committed, we still have to suffer the same consequences. And now, I know a lot of people ask, like, why? That's not fair. Like, why should I be responsible for what Adam did? It's not, it doesn't sound too fair, right? Well, let me ask you something. If you were Adam, if it wasn't Adam, if it was you instead, and you had this really cool looking tree that bore this really nice fruit, and somebody came up to you and said, hey, if you eat this fruit, even though your dad told you not to, you're going to be like your dad. You're going to be better than your dad. How many of you, well, I can actually resist that temptation? To be honest with yourselves, how many of you can actually resist that temptation? I don't think many of us can. Now, there's another thing that I wanted to point out here. Anyone know who plays Pascal is? Pascal, who is one of the most famous mathematicians that ever lived. Pascal had this phrase that he used in one of his writings. He calls it the dignity of causality. The dignity of causality. And what that means is that God, in his wisdom, gave us the right to make our own decisions. So he ceded some of his authority over all of creation to us. He gave it to us. He gave his authority over, some of his authority over to us so that we can make decisions. Now, okay, we can make decisions, but our decisions can also matter. That's the most important thing. That's the dignity of it. God allows our decisions to make a difference. Right? Think about it. If God gave us the right to make a decision and it didn't matter, what would be the point of it? If we wanted to choose to do the right thing, it's like this. So a lot of people ask, why is there suffering in this world? Okay, um, let's use this as an example. If I'm walking down the street, there's a banana on the sidewalk, and I'm walking, I didn't see it, and I slip on it, and then instead of breaking my back, right before I hit the ground, God picks me up and puts me back on the road. And I didn't see that because I was using my cell phone. I decided to, instead of looking at the street, I decided to use my cell phone. Or, or children, if they see the burning fire on the stove, and they, don't, they know that it's hot, but they go and reach it anyway. But instead of getting burned by the fire, God makes the fire cold so that they don't get burned. Think about it. If God treated every potential accident, every bad decision that we made like that, then our decisions really wouldn't matter. What would be the point of existence at all? There would be no point, right? Because none of our choices matter anyway. God's going to protect us in the end anyway. And in the end, what's the ultimate conclusion to that? If we know that God's always going to protect us, then we don't have to worry about anything. And this, we're going to think that we don't need God anymore. That everything's, in, in the end, like, I'm not going to get hurt. This, why should I go to God if, in the end, everything is going to be okay? We're going to forget that God is even there. We're going to forget that God is even there because he spoiled us to the point. I'm saying if he takes all the pain away from us, we're going to get to the point where we realize God is not even there anymore. So this is why, this is one of the reasons why creation is the way it is. God gave us the right to make decisions that matter. A lot of these decisions are going to cause us to suffer. But in this suffering, and we'll go over that more next week, in this suffering we'll realize our true need for God. So, let's go back to this diagram over here. When we talk about the flesh, anyone who studies basic physics knows that gravity, the force of gravity has an acceleration of, what is it, 9.8 meters per second per second. That's pretty much all I remember from physics. But the force of gravity is an acceleration. Now, we have to realize something. The force of this world has an acceleration too. And I think when I say that, you guys all know what I'm talking about. There's this pull. This world has a constant pull on our soul, and that's what Watchman Nee was talking about. This force is constantly pulling our soul towards the world. It's pulling us away from God. And nothing that we do can break this escape velocity, 
escape velocity, you know, when a rocket takes off, right? When a rocket takes off, it needs to achieve a certain velocity before it can break the pull of gravity, right? You have to go a certain speed before you can break free from the gravity that the Earth exerts over that rocket, and that's called the escape velocity. There's nothing we can do to exert enough force to pull ourselves away from this world. It doesn't happen. We don't have the strength. All right, let's keep reading from Romans 5, verses 5 to 8, together. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For, the mind, for to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's a problem, right? I'm missing a slide. Oh, here we go. So, let's look at this slide again. This is different now. Look at this verse. He who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. 1 Corinthians 1.17. And then next it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. This is what Jesus told his disciples right before he died. That he would send a Helper to us. Who is this Helper? I think we, most of us know the answer to that. The Helper is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is that other force that's been missing from our lives before we accepted Christ. For our entire lives, before we knew Christ, we're constantly being affected by this force over here. We're totally under the force of the flesh. But once we receive Christ into our hearts, immediately we become indwelled with the Holy Spirit. There's a new force acting on us now. Okay? And that force is pulling our soul towards God. And what makes that possible is the Holy Spirit is what connects to our spirit. Our spirit is kind of like an antenna for the Holy Spirit. It allows God to connect to us. Now let's go through this flow chart over here. It's a very basic flow chart, but I, this is very important for all of us to understand. This is how the Holy Spirit becomes a part of us. So first, let's read this verse. In love he predestined us for, for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ. Now most Protestant churches believe that we are chosen by God to receive the faith that we need to believe in Him. So by God's grace, it awakens, God's grace awakens our faith. This verse in John 15, 16 says, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, He may give it to you. So it says here that because God awakens our spirit immediately, He gives us, He awakens our faith immediately, He gives us the spirit. And, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead a little bit. After He awakens our faith, when, and what does that mean? When our faith is awakened, that means we accept Christ. We know what Christ did for us. And immediately we become righteous. We become righteous in God's eyes. We're justified and we're no longer condemned. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And once we are positionally justified in Christ, then the Holy Spirit comes upon us. In Ephesians 13, it says, In Him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and belief in Him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. You're sanctified. Now, I have to share something with you guys that this, uh, over the last couple of months, I, I've struggled with the issue of the Holy Spirit because um, I, when I first came to church, I was, uh, I was in a church that I felt made the Holy Spirit look a little bit like a circus. And um, for the longest time, 
I didn't. I took my eye, my focus away from the Holy Spirit. But then, recently, slowly, I'm beginning to realize that there is a right way to relate to commune with the Holy Spirit, and we must because that's the only way that we can receive the power of God. So, getting to this point where I can be speaking about this comfortably was a journey for me, and um, God's opened my eyes in many ways about the Holy Spirit. So I just wanted to share that with you, and uh, for any of you that might be struggling with the same thing. So let's talk about who the Holy Spirit is. So when I when I first learned about the Holy Spirit, I didn't think the Holy Spirit was was a person. I didn't think of it about it as a person. I thought that it was a power that I can just conjure up. You guys, some of you guys may know what this is. This is Dragon Ball. And this is when the super science are powering up. It's like, come in, come in, how, pow! And all of a sudden, he receives this power, right? Or, for those who are older school than me. Oh. <laughs> that was this, right? He lifts his sword and he goes, I have the power! Right? It's that another summoning of some kind of power from somewhere. And this one, this is, this is from the, uh, one of the recent Star Wars movies. They're going to break into this new Death Star that they built, and Finn, he, he has no idea what the force is, but he heard about it, and he said, let's use the force to break in, and Han Solo's like, that's not how the force works, you don't even know what the force is. And I think the reason I show that is because I think a lot of people may not know how the Holy Spirit works, because I didn't, I didn't know how, I didn't, really, I didn't really understand how the Holy Spirit works, so I was like that guy, like, let's just use the Holy Spirit, you see that power, and bam, I'm going to be changed, it doesn't work like that. So, basic stuff here. We know what the Trinity is, right? God is composed of three persons and one Godhead. Now, a lot of other religions may claim that because of this, we're a polytheistic religion. We believe in multiple gods. But this is something, I think, that is impossible for our physical limited minds to understand. That you can have three persons be one Godhead, be one, be one entity. Some people say, yeah, this is easy to understand. But actually, if you think about it, it's really not that easy to understand. Because look over here. The Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Father. But they all are God. They're all part of God. And the reason why we depict it as a trinity is because they are in perfect respect of one another. They all each respect each other. And they all obey the Father, who is the one was calling the shots. Now, the Holy Spirit is depicted. How is the Holy Spirit depicted in paintings and in art sometimes? Fire. What, do you, what do you see over here? Actually, you can't really see it. It's not that clear on this, on this projector. But what is that? It's a bird, right? It's a dove. And the reason why they depict the Holy Spirit as a dove is because when Jesus was baptized, it said that the Holy Spirit came upon Jesus like a dove. But I feel like, in a way, that does a disservice to the Holy Spirit because it makes the Holy Spirit look like kind of a weak thing. So I, I found this image, and I thought this was really cool. It was made by another church for a promotional video. And like, I like to imagine the Holy Spirit like this. This is like, it's kind of like a dove, but it's a spirit, it's a power. And I'm not saying the Holy Spirit looks like that. I hope like you can all have your own different impressions of that. But like the Holy Spirit represents a power that we cannot imagine. It's beyond our comprehension. John 14, 16 says, But when the Father sends the Advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, He will teach you everything and remind you of everything that I have told you. So the Holy Spirit is the person, not the thing, is the person, the advocate that God sends to be our representative. The Holy Spirit speaks to God for us. When we pray, our prayers are flowing through the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit communicates that with Jesus and God the Father. Let's go over some of the things that the Holy Spirit has done that maybe some of you may not be quite aware of. So I made a, a greatest hits list of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Let's look at a couple of these. 
Did you guys know that the Holy Spirit was involved in the conception of Jesus? He was also involved in the resurrection of Jesus. Um, it's clear that he was in the he was at Pentecost. He's he's the one that allowed the apostles to speak in tongues, the flaming tongues. He's also the power that heals the sick. He's the power that casts out demons. He's the power that authored the scriptures. He's also the power that regenerates our spirit. Remember the diagram for part spirit? He's the one that regenerates that part of who we are. And lastly, just a small thing that the Holy Spirit did. He made all of creation. Small thing, right? But the Holy Spirit was the one that created everything that we see. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the power in us. And I think many of us don't realize that. That's why I feel like when you picture the Holy Spirit as a bird that really doesn't do its service, because the Holy Spirit is so much more. So now you're asking yourself, maybe, if you're paying attention, is the Holy Spirit in me? Do I have the Holy Spirit? Right? Do you guys, are you guys wondering that? Do I have the Holy Spirit? Well, before we answer that question, we have to think about something else. Let's read together Romans 8, 9 to 11. Together out loud, okay? You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Spirit who dwells in you. So it's clear here that if you have faith in Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Right? If you have Christ, you have the Holy Spirit. Now the question is, do we have that faith? Do we really have that faith? And Unfortunately, there's no measuring stick for whether we can see, test. If we, if we did, we would have a measuring stick right outside church, or one that comes in and would measure. Like, okay, you have faith, but you don't have faith. But there's no measuring stick. There's no formula. There's no way to tell it. There's no measuring stick to tell if our faith is authentic. But in my opinion, and this is my opinion, and you can study the Bible and see how we can know if we have that faith. In my opinion, I think we can know if we have that faith if we recognize exactly what we were saved from. Do we all know what we were saved from? Were we saved from a bad day? Were we saved from financial ruin? Were we saved from cancer? What were we saved from? We were saved from eternal torment. We were saved from eternal torment. Now, I don't know if anyone ever thought about what that might be like. But think about this. When God says we are dead to our flesh, what he's saying is, you guys all know what a zombie looks like, right? We all know what a zombie looks like. We, we before we are saved, we're the walking dead. We're all the walking dead. According to eyes, in God's eyes, we are all the walking dead. Let that sink in. God sees us. He sees a whole world of zombies just walking around. But he loved us so much that he said, I'm going to give these zombies life again through my son. So what we need to realize is that it's only through faith in Christ that we can be saved, that we can be regenerated, regenerated again in Christ and now no longer be condemned to eternal torment. So I mentioned before, Jesus is not the one that can save you from these temporary things that we worry about. Jesus is the savior of your eternal souls. Now, I debated whether I should talk about this or not, but I think I think it's important to, to discuss this because I'm very concerned about all of our eternal souls. In Ecclesiastes 12 said, it says that when we die, our spirits return to God. Okay, now, many of us don't think about that. In the diagram that we saw before, where there's three parts of us, there's a spirit part. When we die, the spirit returns to God. Now, the spirit returns to us on our resurrection. When we're resurrected again, the spirit returns to us. 
But for, the, for those who believe, for those who don't believe, who don't have faith, the spirit, you no longer have the spirit, just the soul. You have no body anymore. So what's left? It's the soul. And the soul is the one that dwells in eternal anguish, in hell. Or, there's many names for hell. Okay, I don't want to go too much into that. But the soul is what anguishes over that eternal torment. And so the question again is, do you know what you were saved from? Do you truly believe that your faith in Christ saved you from eternal torment? That he's the only one that can do it. If you believe that, then bam, you're justified. You're righteous. It's that simple. It's not even, we can talk in detail about different, but according to Orthodox Scripture, Orthodox translation of Scripture, the moment you believe, the moment you have faith, you're justified, and the Holy Spirit dwells within you immediately, because you positionally, in God's eyes, you've been made righteous. We become the temple of God. You've heard that before, right? We become the temple of God. Our body becomes that temple, and the Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside, inside us. Are we all on the same page? This is absolutely essential for our faith. Over a couple of relevant verses. First Corinthians 3.16 this says, Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Okay, just verses to back up what I'm saying. I want to make sure that you guys know I'm making, not making this stuff up. First John 4.2 says, By this you know that the spirit of God, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come, in the flesh is from God. So let's talk about what does that mean? Jesus Christ came in the flesh. Jesus Christ, this is, this is just a basic explanation of the gospel. God, Jesus, the Son of God, who lived with God in heaven, came as a man to this world to die for our sins. He came to this world in flesh to die for all of mankind for our sins to redeem us, so that we would no longer have to face the consequences of our sin. So in John, in 1 John 4, 2, it says, I'm going to read it again. By this you know the Spirit of God. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So what John is saying is, if you confess, if you know, and you can loudly proclaim, if you can proclaim that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, you have the Spirit of God. Okay? If you truly believe that. So let me ask you guys. Do you believe that Jesus Christ came in the flesh? Do you believe that? If you do, then you're saved. Sorry, can, can someone grab me a tissue? <laughs> okay, let's go on. So now that we know we have the Holy Spirit in us, okay, if we truly believe we know that we have the Holy Spirit in us, now you're asking, so how do I, how does this Holy Spirit work in me? Thank you. Oh, this is fancy. How can the Holy Spirit work in us? We all have this power as believers, right? As saints, we have this we have the power of the Holy Spirit, this relationship with the Holy Spirit. But again, like I mentioned before, it's not like Dragon Ball, it's not like He-Man, it's not like the Force. It's not this impersonal power. It's a, the Holy Spirit is not an it. In the Bible, he's referred to as a he. He's a person that wants a relationship with us. Having this relationship with the Holy Spirit allows us to have a relationship with Jesus. It allows us to have a relationship with God the Father. It allows us to have a relationship with God. It's one and the same. And when we know who the Holy Spirit is, when we recognize what He can do, we can work with Him. Do you remember when I spoke last time? You probably don't. That the, the, um, I said that God doesn't want us to work for Him. He wants us to work with Him. And the way that we work with God is by the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Now, why did Paul spend all this time writing all this in Romans? If we have the Holy Spirit, 
Should it just automatically take over? Should we not just automatically immediately just have like our old operating system, whoever, how the old for us was just overridden by the Holy Spirit, and we would be operating in this brand new way? Why did Paul spend so much time trying to convince us that we have to have this relationship with the Holy Spirit? It's because we have the choice. We have a choice to work with the Holy Spirit. We've been given that free will, whether we want to or not. And Paul is urging us that we have to in order to break free of the force of sin, of the force of the flesh that's in this world. That's the only way. And he knows that God respects us. Remember what I said before about the, the dignity of causality. God respects our choices. He's going to let us suffer or enjoy, depending on the choice that you make, the consequences of your decisions. So we can decide to live in peace and joy in His Spirit, or we can or we can decide to live in pain and suffering by following our own bad decisions. He respects that choice. Now, what's preventing us from allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us? I'm going to go through three kinds of I call it spiritual postures. Three kinds of spiritual postures that prevent us from allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. And the only reason I've, I've identified these is because I struggle with the same things. Okay, let's look at the first one. All right, this is what I call, Lord help me. This, this is the Lord help me spiritual posture. Okay, this is the posture where I keep calling to God for help. But actually, I don't even know what I'm doing. I just call to God for help whenever I'm in trouble. Like, there's so many things going on in my life. All I can do is, like, just, God, help me. God, help me. But actually, once God helps me, immediately, I go back being like this again. I'm like, I'm just... So really, there's no really, there's no real downtime. It's just constant, oh, God, I'm so screwed up. God, help me. And then, when God helps me, you get back to me. Like, oh, my God, I'm so screwed up. It's constantly like this. Okay? You never at peace. You're never in stasis. Things are, you're never at equilibrium. Your, your life is just constantly a mess. Okay? The next one is called, I got this, God. Okay? Now, what, what this represents over here is we think that we can dodge all the things that the world throws at us. Like this guy over here. Right? It's going like this. Like, you, like, the world can't get me. I don't need you, God. I'm okay. I got this. But in the end, like, he just looks stupid like that. We all look stupid by not coming to God. Eventually, we're going to fall on our face. And then lastly, this one speaks for itself. This is fine. You guys, you guys have seen this meme before, right? All right, what, what do you think this means over here? You got this dog who's sitting in burning fire, and he thinks everything is okay, and he's drinking his coffee. But actually, obviously, things are not fine. Things are really not fine. And some of us, myself included, have been stuck in this spiritual posture for a long time where I think life is pretty okay and I don't, I don't really need God because everything is fine right now. But actually, things are not fine because as long as we are not living in the Spirit, we're dead in God's eyes. The flames of hell are right around the corner. Understand that. So all of these, all of these spiritual postures are eventually going to lead to disaster, right? All of them are going to lead to disaster. The first lady is going to slip on the ice and break her back or her face. The first guy is going to get knocked out eventually by being, they're trying to dodge stupidly like that. And this dog is going to be burned to a crisp eventually if he keeps sitting in that house. So what keeps us in these spiritual postures? Why do we stay like this? It's because of the time that we spent in the world. These are the remnants, the vestiges of our old nature. We spent our entire lives being bound to the world. And we get used to responding like this to all these different circumstances because the world has taught us that we have to take care of ourselves. Nobody's going to take care of us. We've got to figure out how to deal with it ourselves. We don't need God. We, God wasn't even in the picture for the longest time until we realized that there's nothing we can do anymore. And this was a repeating problem for me. There were a lot of things that I kept struggling with over and over again, and I just couldn't break free from it. 
until I realized how to allow God to work through me in the Holy Spirit. There are things that the Holy Spirit has revealed to me over the course of the last year. And I know I've been a Christian for almost 15 years now. And it's just recently that I started to learn how to work with the Holy Spirit, to allow the Holy Spirit to work in me. One of the biggest things that the Holy Spirit revealed to me is that I, there's this term called performance-oriented. I, it made me realize that he made me realize that I was a very performance-oriented person. That I took it upon myself to externally appear awesome to everyone. Okay, I, for me it was very important that I appeared not physically. I'm not talking about physically. Okay, I have nothing to brag about physically. What I'm talking about is in terms of my personality, my character, my integrity. It was of the utmost importance that I in your eyes was an upstanding person that you can trust. But I didn't do it through God, I did it in my own strength because it was a form of this weird um, narcissism. It's not an external narcissism, it's an internal narcissism. I needed to internally be right, be perfect. And for the longest time, that prevented me from allowing God to work in me because I thought that I could figure it all out on my own. I could be awesome on my own. That I got this. That I got this, that I was that box going like that, or I was the guy sitting, I was the dog sitting in the fire. <laughs> but here's the thing, even though I was so performance oriented, I'm a lazy person. So I wanted to figure out the fastest way to be awesome in everybody's eyes. <laughs> as ridiculous as that sounds. And then when I read about the Holy Spirit, I thought, hey, the Holy Spirit can let me be more awesome. So let me try that. And then what I did was I spent the least amount of time I could, could with God praying. Like, and this is kind of, I actually implemented I, that idea of like powering up and the force coming into me. At first I started like that. I was like, Holy Spirit, give me the power to be good. Bam, I'm good. But it didn't work like that. It just doesn't work like that. The Holy Spirit doesn't give you this power to be good instantly like that. So it, it made me think like, Bill Gates, uh, Bill Gates hires lazy people. If you guys heard of that before. He purposely hires lazy people because he said, lazy people find creative ways to solve problems. Right? <laughs> Let's think about the mousetrap. The mousetrap, there's this guy sitting in the house, there's cats all over the place catching rats, and he's sick and tired of picking up cat poop. So he, what does he do? He says, this guy would be a better way, and he makes the mousetrap. Or the remote control, or autonomous cars. But the thing is, these are just manly constructs to solve our manly, our worldly problems, the Holy Spirit, there is no shortcut to allowing the Holy Spirit to work in us. I just couldn't overcome it. No matter what I did, I kept struggling with the same problems. Over the course of the last couple of years, I dealt with some of the worst problems that I've ever had to in my life, legally, relationship-wise, and health-wise. And I struggled with it in my own strength, and I just felt like the world pulling me lower and lower and lower to a darker and darker place. And, I, and what's funny is, at one point, and um, I've shared this with some of you guys before, God released me from that struggle, from that pain that I was dealing with when we were flying to Kyrgyzstan, I think a few years ago, that I joined the, I joined the mission team to Kyrgyzstan. And somewhere while we were flying over the North Pole, I just thought in my mind that Somewhere over the North Pole, my, my, my heart is aligned with God. So, instantly, this feeling of joy and peace came over me. Now, I'm sharing this with you not because this is a permanent experience, relationship with the Holy Spirit. God allowed me to taste what that was like at that moment, the feeling of release, the feeling of the, whole, the temporary taste of the Holy Spirit, what, what that would be like. And then things got better. My legal problems were gone. My relationship problems were gone. My health problems were gone. And then I became like the dog sitting in the fire. This is fine. I don't need God anymore. Everything's good again. But deep down, I remember the joy and the peace that I felt while I was in the midst of a storm, struggling with all those things in my life. And I remember, you guys remember Brother Carl. He shared his story with us about his cancer. Before 
he learned to give everything to God. I remember the first time I went to his house, he was still a very self-reliant person. He was telling us how he knew how to solve all his problems. He was taking traditional Chinese medicine. He was still, he's not here today, so I can say this, he was still a little cocky. <laughs> oh wait, I'm being recorded. Edit that out. <laughs> he still basically felt like he was in control. And I remember I, I went to him and I told him, Carl, learn to give everything to God, and you're going to experience a joy and peace that you've no, never felt before. This was right after I got out of all the mess that I was in, all the things I was struggling with. So that, I still had that strong feeling of joy and peace. I could tell him that. But over the series of the course of that, over a few months after saying that to him, what's funny is our positions reversed. When he found out that his tumor grew another inch, he learned to give everything to God. He learned that everything, every decision, every single little decision that he made in his life, he needed to consult God with. He needed to go to the Holy Spirit. And I looked at him and I was like, wow, that's pretty interesting. And at first it was just an observation, but then I felt my heart going astray. I felt my heart getting pulled away from God because of my comfort. It's a natural thing. But in his struggles, he learned to trust God and the Holy Spirit. That's not something, that's something that I didn't learn in my struggles. But just watching him, every decision that he made, even canceling, remember his testimony at the end, he canceled his chemo doctor. He didn't have a replacement. He heard God tell him to cancel his chemo doctor, and he did that. I don't think I ever could have done that. But that was the Holy Spirit guiding his heart. So in this relationship that I've had with Carl, watching him through his walk and faith, it taught me that, actually, it's only by complete reliance on the Holy Spirit that I can really have peace. That peace that I had once before in the storm. It's the surrender, because we know that we cannot struggle against the flesh. We just cannot win. So what did I do after realizing this? I started spending a lot of time fasting. I started time in devotion. I spent time in the morning praying, sometimes for hours. I made sure I did my Bible study. Now, I don't always read the Bible. I use the daily audio Bible. My Sunday school students, I hope you remember. I force you guys to download that on your phone. And I hope you're still using it today. Brian, are you still using it? <laughs> I'll take that as a yes. So this is what I do. This is what I've been doing almost every morning. I wait for that still small voice to speak to me. Now, it's, for me, it's not a voice. For some other people, it might be a voice. But for me, it's that communion. It's that, that I feel I'm back in alignment with God. Because I surrender and tell God that, God, it's not about me. You do whatever you need to be in, for me in my heart. I'm not going to assert my will over yours. And what did God reveal to me? I already shared one. is the performance orientation. I realized that I can't keep relying on myself to be perfect. And perfection is not even the goal. I wasn't perfect by a long shot. And God made me realize that. I had all these issues with pride, with trying to assert my standard of perfection over my wife, with my relationship with my dad, how I always thought that I knew better than him. The Holy Spirit made me realize that. And there's still so many more things that I'm sure that the Holy Spirit will feel to me as I go on. But this, is only, this can only happen if you submit to the power of the Spirit. So let's read Hebrews 4.12. He talks about this. Sorry, I'm going to have order. Hebrews 4.11-12 says, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So what's, what is the author of Hebrews saying over here? He's saying that the Holy Spirit knows every little thing about you. If there's something wrong with you, if you allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you, the Holy Spirit will reveal what's wrong. Because the Holy Spirit sees between, it's, an, it's a sword that can see, that can go between the, the spirit and the soul, the joints and the marrow. So I ask you, what haven't you guys surrendered to God yet? What does the Holy Spirit need to reveal to you? 
do you have, are, is it your relationship with your kids? Is it your obsession over your health or your career or even your self-image? Your struggle with lust, with hopelessness? And one of the biggest things, like myself, is the struggle over ourselves. Right? I remember Jack, it's funny that I never thought about this, the, the, the Jack, the little Jack. He, uh, he was sharing something that he learned from um, the systematic theology class he was taking with David. He said our biggest idol is ourselves. And for some reason that thought never crossed my mind. But actually if you think about it, our biggest idol is ourselves. We have to overcome ourselves. So what part of us do we need to overcome ourselves? It's, uh, oh, it's 11.53. I'll try to wrap this up soon. I just want to go over one more point. There's a, there's a little story that happens in the book of Jeremiah, in chapter 27, where God tells Jeremiah to go wear a yoke around his neck and walk into the middle of Jerusalem and tell the Jews that they have to do the same thing, that they have to yield. They have to yield to the Babylonians when they come. If they do that, if they wear this metaphorical yoke around their neck, if they bend the knee to the Babylonians, then God will allow them to stay where they are in Israel. Okay? Now, look at this yoke. It looks pretty ridiculous, right? Jeremiah walked, wore that into Jerusalem in humility, in obedience to God. I don't think anyone, I don't think he wanted to do that. But he, he decided he was going to obey God. He wanted to give this message out to the Jews that you must submit in order to receive the grace of God. Basically, that's what he's telling everyone. You have to submit to God to receive the grace of God. But of course, unfortunately, the Jews didn't. The Babylonians came in, conquered them, moved them all over the world. And um, for 80 years, they were outside of Jerusalem. They were... They were scattered all over the face of the earth, the known, the known world. Now, there's this verse that I, let's, let's read this together, together now, now. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Who said that? Who said this? Yeah, Jesus said this. So we see the yoke again, right? This is the yoke again, similar to the one that Jeremiah was wearing. But what's different about this yoke? This yoke has two hoops. It's for two cows, for two whatever um, donkeys or whatever kind of animal that does pulling. But Jesus is saying he wants us to wear this yoke. But we're not wearing it by ourselves. He's wearing it with us. And his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He's going to take that burden off our shoulders. What we need to realize is we are all yoked to something. If we're not yoked to Jesus, what are we yoked to? We're yoked to the flesh. We're yoked to the world. Whether we like it or not, there's this burden on our shoulders and we're constantly wearing this. We're constantly bearing this load of the world, of this force. This force is pulling us down, pulling us away. And Jesus said, here, I'll bear this yoke with you. I'm going to take the load off your shoulders because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is the yoke, this is the cross that Jesus bore on his way to crucifixion. This looks kind of like a yoke, right? Actually, this is symbolic for what he was talking about before. Jesus bore this. He bore the sins, the weight of all the sins of the world for us so that we wouldn't have to bear it, so that he can take that load off us, so that we would no longer be un unequally known to this world. And it's only by giving in, submitting to Jesus and learning to walk with him that we can receive the work, the power of the Holy Spirit in us. So Galatians 5.22 talks about the fruits of the, the fruit of the Spirit. What is, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, what does that look like, right? How do you know that you have the Holy Spirit in you? And it's very clear over here. The fruit of the Spirit are these things, these nine things. 
It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there's no law. So if you see these things manifesting in your life, you know that the fruit of the Spirit is developing in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the authentic kind, not the one that we develop on our own. This is a godly love, a godly self-control, a godly peace and patience. Um, I'm going to cut this short. Um, we're going to talk about suffering next week. I think Pastor Lenny will be back to cover the last half of Romans 8, where it goes into suffering, why there's suffering, why we need to suffer in order to experience the Holy Spirit. Now, I want to end with something called a pray reading. I learned this from a friend recently. What pray reading is, is you take verses from the Bible and you modify it according to what you need. And I modified Romans 8 to 17 in a form of a prayer. So let's, let's pray together using prayer reading. Together now, okay? We're praying. This is a prayer from the book of Romans. Let's read this together. Dear Father, we know that we are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Because your spirit dwells in us, anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to you. But since he is in us, although our body is dead because of sin, the spirit revives us because of his righteousness. Since the spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, he will also give life to our mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in us. So then, we will no longer live according to the flesh. For if we do, we will die. But if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the body, we will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons and daughters of God. Because we have been adopted as your children through the Spirit, we can cry, Abba, Father. Your Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then your heirs and fellow heirs with Christ. In our suffering with him, may we also be glorified with him. We pray all this in the spirit by the authority of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So spirit reading, uh, prayer reading is actually pretty easy. You can, mostly people use psalms to do that. You can say, Dear God, and then begin reading the psalms. Change the eyes to me, the day to us. And um, there's a power in doing that, in praying in God's Word. The uh, Christine, can you come up?
your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the Spirit that guides us, that advocates for us, that goes to you and pleads on our behalf. Because of your Spirit, Lord, we know that we are no longer condemned. Because of your Spirit, we can be pure. We can live righteous, really, truly righteous lives in your eyes by our transformation, by the transformation of our hearts. I just pray right now that for those of you that feel God, that God has spoken to you today, don't miss out on this opportunity. Have this connection with your God and your Savior. If you feel that God is speaking to your heart today, I pray that you would be able to reach out to Pastor Richard, to Thomas, or me, so that we can pray for you and so that we can arrange for you to be baptized. Let us all rejoice and let us all bask in the glory of your light, of your love, of the peace and joy that can only come through the communion with your spirit. We thank you for praying these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.